Hello, and welcome to the Alexander Society. It's a podcast. It's about people from history and things from history. And coping to realize that we are shitty people. Yeah, and a constant existential reminder of the futility of morality in the face of overwhelming power and authority. Amen, brother. I'll drink to that. Um, so, yeah, this is a podcast. We talk about history. We drink. We've got rules. Tim, how are you doing? I'm doing good, bud. Uh, it's been a little bit, but we're doing good. What about you? Um, super busy. Uh, not, uh, this is actually going to be a bit of a short episode. I know I told you that, but for our audience, this is going to be a bit of a short episode because I've been busy and distracted the last couple weeks. We'll try and make sure that the shortness does not mean low quality, my dudes. So what are you drinking tonight, Derek? Tonight, I am going to be drinking some Jack Daniels uh, Tennessee Apple, which is insanely good. Apple whiskey is... I I quite enjoyed the crown apple I drank on the show. I imagine it's going to be good on Jack Daniels. I don't like OG Jack Daniels, but I bet you their apple is delicious. Yeah, it's... I still haven't found an apple whiskey that I haven't liked. They're all so, so good. (laughs) Um, And for my drinks, uh, I just brought back that Revolver Brewing uh, Blood and Honey beer because I still had a few left, and I love it to death. Okay. Uh, What are you drinking? So I didn't realize how local, but I thought it was an o- at least an Oklahoma beer. But I got Raspberry Pride, which is a fruited kettle sour. I don't know what the difference between a fruited kettle sour and a regular sour is. But hey-ho, it's by Neff here in Tulsa. I didn't realize they were that close till I got to look at it right before we started recording. It's got beautiful artwork. And for my liquor, I am still sipping on that uh, Cimarron Tequila. Yeah. So, in this illustrious organization of ours, we have a set of rules that we abide by. Rule number one, we take a shot at the start of the episode. So, Tim. Cheers. Oh, wait. Did you actually have your shot ready for once? Yes, I had my shot ready. Don't get a big head about it. It's the end of the world! (laughs) Man, that... That... That whiskey is so sweet. It's so good. And it it's like the sweetness makes it smoother and it goes down so easy. I love this stuff. Rule number two is if there's an event in our story where someone dies, we will take a sip. Rule number three. If we mention someone who is in a previous topic, we take a sip. Rule number four. If alcohol is mentioned, take a sip. Rule number five, if there's an event in the script where someone dies and alcohol is involved, we take a shot. Oh, and tonight's extra rules. Take it away, Derek. Every time somebody does something weird for a religious reason, we take a shot. Every time someone relocates and moves west, we take a sip. Every time somebody has a weird name which has come up a lot in this this story so far, we take a shot. That's our rules. When we left off, Ethan and his family had just been driven out of their home in Salisbury, Connecticut, by their neighbors and town elders who were sick of his blatant radicalism and his deism. Why did they let him back in for, like, a little bit before he left like was it wasn't his mom sick or something or was his wife pregnant yeah they let him in um to take care of his wife until she gave birth and to get all of his stuff in order so that he could move out okay i was trying to make sure which one because i was le- i was that was those were my two theories it was either mom or wife but i wasn't sure on the mom part because i had thought she'd already died right uh, she's not dead yet. Um, at this point, she's still living back in... Uh, I can't even remember what the town is. The original town where they lived before. Uh, I thought that he wouldn't 
he wanted to wait till his mom was doing okay. Like, because that's why he stayed in the town for a little bit. No, he was, he, after his father died, he just stayed in, uh, Cornwall. That was the town. He stayed in Cornwall to, uh, put all of his father's affairs in order. But, and he was thinking about relocating, uh, all of the Allens, including his mother to, uh, some land that his father had bought in the Wyoming Valley in North Pennsylvania, but he had decided against it because he didn't think that his mother was in a good emotional state for a, a move like that. Okay, that's I remember she for some reason I thought it was her health, but emotional state does make sense. Yeah, so at this point she's still back in Cornwall living with the rest of her kids. Okay. Or some of her kids. A lot of them have like are moving around a lot, but but yeah, he'd just been driven out of Salisbury because he was a radical, he was a deist, he was disrespectful of Puritan faith, and he just wasn't easy to live around because of his temper and no i i anyone who's like he's basically got like an unofficial founding father right yeah pretty much his his name isn't on any anyone yeah his name isn't on any important document but the revolutionary war wouldn't have taken the same path without him yeah i was kind of like anyone who was kind of in that general group at that time probably weren't easy to get along with oh no they were all like very pretentious people the founding fathers were because, like, they were all lawyers, and they were all, like, Harvard and Yale educated. In the fall of 1765, they made their way north to live with a cousin of Ethan, a guy named Thomas Allen, and his wife Betty in Northampton, Massachusetts. Before we get too far into that, let's zoom out for a moment. Parliament had just passed a new law called the Stamp Acts in March of 1765. I think you talked about that last episode, but for refresh my memory. Yeah, I mentioned it right at the end because the it was right as they're moving to Northampton that the Stamp Act, that all the, the consequences surrounding the Stamp Act are starting to happen. So um, the Stamp Act, Stamp Acts were passed in March of 1765, set to go into effect in November. In response to the announcement of the acts, the colonists all over the American colonies began forming cells of a secret society called the Sons of Liberty in order to protect against the implementation of the tax and to protest against it. The Sons would often use violence and intimidation against crown officials, forcing them to abandon their enforcement of the stamps or even drive them out of their homes altogether. This is when tarring and feathering first became a big thing. Wait, that I, I I thought that was always like a gag. I didn't think it ever actually happened historically. No, it happened, and it's way worse. It's way more brutal than any they ever explained in school. No, you're bo- pouring boiling tar on someone and then throwing something soft on it that is going to be hard to get out without like ripping your skin. Yeah, but. Like, the way that it was presented, I didn't even know, like, how bad tarring and feathering actually was until I was a grown adult. Because when I was a kid and learning about it in school, they didn't explain that the tar was boiling. I that They gave me the impression that it was just po- pouring something sticky on them and then covering them in feathers. And it was supposed that it was meant to be, like... Uh, like to humiliate them, to publicly humiliate them. I didn't realize it was actually like a like a form of torture because I didn't know that the tar was actually boiling. I don't know when I made that connection. I know at first I didn't realize it was boiling, but at some point I made that connection. But it's it's another one of those things that you did in your childhood that you didn't consciously realize when you realized it. Yeah, and there are like. There are pictures like of the from the early 1800s of survivors of tarring and feathering, uh, and their their whole bodies are just covered in burn scars. I'm surprised many people survived it, to be perfectly honest, because that it it sounds like an excruciating thing. Yeah, it's yeah, you're it it not only is it boiling, but it sticks to your skin, so it's impossible to get off. Once it cools, it fuses to your skin, so the process of getting it off is just tearing off all that skin. Like, that that's going to kill most people, even today with modern medicine. Back then, I can't fathom how somebody could possibly survive that. I'm. This is just me 
probably not knowing a whole lot about history, but I would assume the only reason you would survive back then is maybe they didn't get the tar hot enough to like, maybe it was just not as hot because they were eyeballing that. Now, if you tarred someone, you probably wait for a specific temperature. You'd be like having a thermometer or something right then and there. Be like, okay, let's get this fucker hot. Yeah, I was assuming that or like some cases they just didn't have enough tar handy. And so they only used a little bit. That's also a good theory. Yeah, because like, like who just has tar sitting around? Like even back then, like roofers today, it would be mostly roofers. Yeah, but like even back then, like just. Like, if you're at a dock or something, which is where most of these tarrings happened because they were being done against, like, uh, like customs officials who worked at the docks. See, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know it was mostly against a specific person. I thought it was just a generic thing that happened back then. Yeah, it was against specifically people. At this point, it was against specifically, like, crown, people who are invested with authority by the crown to enforce uh, customs and taxes. So the guys who would be going on to merchant ships and like taking an inventory and uh, figuring out how much they need to be taxed for it. Basically attacking the tax man. Like we've done always. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so yeah, the sons would often use violence and intimidation against crown officials, uh, forcing them to abandon their enforcement of stamps or even drive them out of their homes. Several public protests organized by the sons turned into riots, the famous stamp act riots. Among the membership of the Sons of Liberty was the Stamp Act riots. No, they were part of the Tea riots, probably, right? Because of the Boston Tea Party. Those come next. Those those are what's what's going to be called the the uh, the towns and acts. Okay. And the Sons of Liberty are also going to be the ones doing that, and I'll probably be talking about it, that in the next episode. Okay. Yeah. So among the membership of the Sons of Liberty were several names that are now famous in American revolutionary history. Guys like Samuel Adams, Paul Revere, John Hancock, Benedict Arnold, and uh, Ethan Allen's old friend from Salisbury, Dr. Thomas Young. Uh, quick question. Is Benedict going to come up this episode or next episode? You said... Yeah, he'll come up next episode when we get into the start of the Revolutionary War. Okay. So, at the same time, that, that, that the Sons of Liberty are starting to become a thing. The Massachusetts General Assembly was calling for an intercolonial meeting of delegates from each colony, a Congress, if you will, to organize a united response to try and compel Parliament to repeal the tax. This Stamp Act, the, it became to be called the Stamp Act Congress, drafted a resolution that they sent to the King and to Parliament, outlining what they believed were the rights of all Englishmen and establishing the idea that because the colonies had no representation in the House of Commons, that the Parliament didn't have a right to pass taxes on the colonies. You may recognize this by the later revolutionary phrase, no taxation without representation, which becomes one of the rallying cries of the American Revolution. That's where this idea is born. It's when it first become, comes into the popular consciousness of the colonies. Merchants in New York came together and organized a non-importation agreement, which meant that one of the two largest ports in the colonies was now no longer buying any goods coming from Britain. Boston and Philadelphia soon followed suit. And as a result of income from trade in the colony, as a result of these, uh, these embargoes, uh, trade in the colonies fell from 2.5 million pounds in 1764 to 1.9 million pounds in 1765. That's the modern equivalent of tens of millions of dollars. Several prominent trading companies in Britain ended up going bankrupt as a result. This economic hit, combined with the threat of violence from the Sons of Liberty, and some effective arguments made by the colonial representative to the House of Commons, a guy you might have heard of named Benjamin Franklin, forced Parliament to repeal the Stamp Act in February of 1766. Just, just, yeah, so three months after it went into effect. So that's what's going on while the Allens are getting settled in at Northampton. Unsurprisingly, Ethan's presence caused quite a bit of a stir in Northampton. 
Northampton was a hotbed of religious orthodoxy in New England, and they had already heard about Ethan's blasphemy and troublemaking back in Connecticut. Uh, Northampton was actually uh, the birthplace of the Great Awakening, and it was also one of the first settlements founded by the original Puritan colonists in Massachusetts. Specifically, it was actually co-founded by one of... uh, by... Remember when I was explaining, like, Ethan's background? Uh, The first Allens in New England were uh, three brothers who were part of a Puritan congregation that came over. Vaguely, yes. One of the other brothers was one of the founders of Northampton. So there's a bit of history already going on here. So on top of all of... On top of Ethan's already established reputation, pretty much all of New England knew about him at this point. The Allens themselves, like the family, already had a bit of a reputation in town on account of Thomas's openness as a new light uh, follower of the Great Awakening. And more specifically, his support for a controversial preacher named Jonathan Edwards, uh, who I'm not going to get into too much his he's got a really weird story and he's a really interesting guy he ends up becoming uh one of the most famous theologians in the western world uh but like how big is he is he like future topic worthy or is he just like oh he's kind of neat um his he was just a scholar he didn't do anything like like exciting he just preached and wrote books for his whole life so i'm not really gonna i don't think i'd do a topic on him but um at the time, like his his works were translate translated into multiple languages and were read throughout Europe. Uh, it so he was he was a really big deal uh, by this point, but he was also very controversial and hated in his hometown of Northampton, Massachusetts. And the fact that Thomas Allen was a very vocal supporter of him made a lot of people like very wary of the Allen family. Makes sense. So you remember how I mentioned that everybody knew everybody else and there's all these weird connections that are going to come up in this story? Yep. Yeah, so Thomas's son, Tom, this uh, this cousin Thomas Allen, his son, who's also named Thomas, was married to a woman by the name of Elizabeth Lee. Elizabeth was the daughter of the Reverend Lee, who was Ethan's old teacher and the guy who had just driven him out of Salisbury. So that everybody was related to everybody in colonial New England. I think we've been over this. It it feels like everyone was related to everybody. Also, that guy I just mentioned, Jonathan Edwards, the theologian. Mm -hmm. His son-in-law was a guy named Aaron Burr Sr., who founded the College of New Jersey, which eventually became Princeton University. And Aaron Burr Sr.'s son, Aaron Burr Jr., would go on to become a founding father, the vice president of the U.S. under Thomas Jefferson, and the guy who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. You weren't kidding when you said everyone knew each other back then. Yeah. Forever immortalizing him as the antagonist in that shitty rap musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda. It, it's it's not that good. Like, I love a good play. Like, I do. It's just, it, I, I want... I didn't get to go see it in person, so I could be biased, but like I watched it on Disney Plus. It wasn't super great. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't great. You know, Um, my main problem with it was how badly they butchered uh, a lot of the characters, like the historical figures portrayed. Um, For one thing, uh, Hamilton was never the good guy. He was a complete and irredeemable bastard in any every sense of the word just one of the worst human beings who has ever lived in this country's history. I mean, that that tracks with our uh, founding fathers. Yeah. Um, When in the 1930s or late, the late twenties, early thirties, when fascism was starting to become a big thing and starting to grow in popularity in the United States, a lot of American fascists pointed to Alexander's Hamilton as a precursor to fascist ideology because of how, violently racist and anti-democracy that he was tracks track there are a lot of scholars in political science and history who actually agree with that he he i have seen 
granted, it's kind of a fringe belief, but I have seen scholars refer to Hamilton as a proto fascist. You have to like sit me down and like talk to me about that because like I I don't know anything really outside of the original, you know, um, that not the original, but from the musical. That's literally all I really know because he wasn't talked about in my history class. But I am. I don't doubt anything you say on that because like if a supremacist group or like fascist group is saying, Hey, we think this guy had some things, right? You're probably pretty close to fascism. And what's even more frustrating about it is how I can't remember exactly like how Aaron Burr was portrayed in the musical, but I, I remember he was kind of like an antagonist figure in real life. Aaron Burr was everything that Lin-Manuel Miranda believes that Alexander Hamilton was. Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr was one of the most progressive people uh, amongst the founding fathers. Interesting. Uh, he was extremely anti-slavery. He was ex- like very pro-woman. He was very pro-poor people. He he was everything that people think that guys like hamilton were based on this shitty music anyways i'm gonna get wrapped up in this i'll stop now there's a there's a great there's a great podcast you can listen to about american history it's called the dollop they just did a series on aaron burr go listen to it it's fantastic uh when the eastons arrived in northampton or when the ethans when the allens arrived in northampton ethan started a job as the manager of that lead mine that i mentioned in the last episode that he and his brother-in-law, Israel Brownson, had invested in. So now he's working as the manager of a lead mine. A mine where they dig up lead (laughs) in the 18th century. So funny story. I just watched um, a YouTube doc on lead and gasoline and how he killed millions of people. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I bet that was fun. Well, it was talking about this guy who basically, he pioneered lead and gasoline so caused a lot of deaths but he also created freon which led to the ozone layer being depleted and a third thing he had like three major scientific contributions that led to ecological disaster and deaths of millions yeah i can't remember his name now but man he he fucked up (laughs) yeah he had an insane effect on the course of human history i had no idea all those were the same guy and how much it fucked up our planet yeah I blame I blame him in large part for the uh, the enormous surge in the institutional power of the right wing, because I I blame him for the, destroying the brains of a generation that eventually voted for Ronald Reagan. That tracks. That definitely tracks. Yeah. So he's now he's working in a lead mine in the 18th century, probably not some uh, not some great working conditions to be honest, but. Like I mentioned in the last episode, the economy at the time was in a slump and profits for this mine were not very good. And so he wasn't getting paid as much as he should have been. So Israel Brownson, his wife's brother, was he was the majority uh, stakeholder. And so he was in charge of like the finances. And so he was responsible for paying Ethan, which he wasn't doing. So Ethan was basically not getting a salary during this time. Good old corporate greed. Yeah. And so Ethan and his family were living hand to mouth. And from here, we can see a bit, uh, another flaw in Ethan's personality. That being that he was a bit vain to the the point of it affecting his family. Have you ever heard the phrase temporarily embarrassed millionaire before? No, but I'm pretty sure I understand the concept. It's the idea that people who have a lot of money and are down on a who don't lose their money believe they're just down on their luck and they're going to get their money back. Yeah. It's, it's basically the idea that the reason that, um, or part of the reason that Americans are so opposed to, uh, like taxing the rich is because they want to be rich. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, nobody in America thinks of themselves as working class. They think of themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. They think eventually they'll get to the point where, they're the ones in charge. And so they don't want to do anything too bad to the people who are in charge. So that's basically what's happening with Ethan here, which I guess in his case is test technically true because he was just like very rich and then got, and that was dropped into poverty. And then after this, he's going to become rich again. 
he's the one time where that was actually true. He's the one time where it's actually true. Yeah. But at the moment, he's impoverished. Ethan was really concerned about presenting his own image as one of a sophisticated up-and-comer. And so he incurred some heavy debts buying a bunch of fancy clothes that he really couldn't afford. And this ended up landing him in court for the first time in the colony of Massachusetts when a merchant sued him for collection of 12 pounds for a beaver skin cap that he had bought on credit and had failed to pay for. So, yeah, he's now getting taken to court over beaver skin caps. Who the fuck buys a hat they can't afford? Like, I understand clothes, shoes, boots, whatever, but a fucking hat? Back then, hats were actually a really important part of your... Like, having a good hat was just as important as, like... Owning a good suit? Yeah, it was... Uh, it was it was even more than that like having a good hat like if you were seen out in public without wearing a hat it was a sign that you were like someone who was up to no good someone who was poor and a troublemaker and disrespectful of gentle like gentlemanly society that all that kind of stuff it was you always if you were outside in colonial america you had to be wearing a hat it was non-negotiable it people would look at you if you like you were naked if you were out in public not wearing a hat that's crazy so having like a very regal sophisticated hat was a very important aspect if you wanted to portray a sense of oh it's where i'm looking for like gentility class um class yes and so he bought like a nice fancy well-made hat for 12 pounds which is was probably a few hundred dollars and he bought it on credit. He failed to pay it back. And so he got taken to court by the merchant who sold it to him. Um, he ended up losing that case, by the way. But he never did pay the guy back. So he basically got that hat for free. <laughs> Hell yeah. But on top of the debts he was racking up, he was also making an ass of himself all over town. I mean, sounds like he kind of deserves it. Um, yeah, he's... At, at this moment, he deserves it. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. He... this. He sounds like a real motherfucker during this time. Um, so his cousin that he was staying with, Thomas, had been giving him like uh, pamphlets and sermons for him to read to try and bring him over to his uh, his new light faith. And Ethan, being the skeptic and uh, scary atheist that he was, uh, would just respond to them with insults. <laughs> That sounds about right. Yeah, which which would be one thing if it was just with Thomas, because Thomas is family, and family sticks together during this time. But he was also making a game of going around to every every one of his neighbors and riling them up by mocking their face to their faces, or doing other stuff just to offend like their delicate religious sensibilities, stuff like. So he was be he he was hurting feelings to hurt feelings. He's being edgy. Yeah, he was he was doing he was being edgy under the guise of like free speech. If that sounds familiar, <laughs> it sounds extremely familiar. Yeah. And so so he was doing stuff like he was cursing. He was telling off color jokes. Um, let, let's be honest here. Theocracy is definitely a bad thing. And the Puritans didn't exactly have a stellar track record with religious tolerance. But no, Ethan, like at this point, Ethan's really just being an asshole for the point just to be an asshole. That's all that's going on here. <laughs> he's because he's, he's still like in his mid 20s at this at this point. So he's he's just it's it's like edgelords. He's being edgy to be edgy because he's allowed he's quote unquote allowed to be. Yeah. And. I guess the thing is, like, technically he wasn't allowed to be. Like, he's he could, and he eventually does face, like, legal reper, rep, uh, repercussions for saying all of this stuff. So, technically, he's right in that he is, like, he he is, like, challenging, like, freedom, like, the restriction on freedom of speech, which is ostensibly his whole point with doing this. But in practice, he just looks like an asshole. 
like he's not meaningfully challenging any of these ideas. He's just being an asshole to make a point. Uh, I.e. everyone who says, well, freedom of speech, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking about as I was reading this. It was like, yeah, that that that, that describes a big portion of people in America right now. <laughs> like 50% of the internet. Um, eventually. Come on, you know it's not only 50%. Um, yeah, I guess. I always kind of saw, like, trolling that that's what he's doing right now is he's trolling it, he's trolling he's literally trolling but he's one of those dumb kind of trolls that thinks that he's like making a profound point by trolling he thinks his trolling is a major statement to society and everyone should learn from his example right yeah yeah that's that's actually exactly like that's a big part of his personality is like he a part of him does think that he's smarter than other people and he wants other people to look up to him and learn from his example. He's a very pretentious guy in all, like all things considered. But anyways, all of this behavior, it eventually got, got the town elders hang angry. It got him angry enough that they ordered him to vacate the town in the summer of 1767. His radical ideals combined with his grating personality had now caused him to be driven him caused him to be driven out of two different towns. Again, sounds about right. Ethan and his family were moving out completely penniless and deep in debt. They had only been in Northampton for about a year. On his way out, Ethan sued his wife's brother Israel to get back the year's pay that he hadn't received from managing the lead mine. He lost the suit. He lost the suit? He lost. I'm not sure why I didn't see, I couldn't find the details of the trial, but he lost. And in response to that, uh, Israel ended up suing him, suing him back, because at some point Israel had brought uh, a trunk full of clothes when he came to visit his sister Mary. And he had accidentally left the trunk at their house. And so Ethan had just taken the trunk of clothes and had tried to sell the <laughs> clothes. Um, it turns out nobody would buy buy them. And so he just had like this trunk of clothes that uh, he wasn't wearing any of them. I bet he refused. I bet he refused to give it back too. Yeah. At this point, he's just keeping it out of spite. And so Israel ended up suing him to get that, get back this trunk full of old clothes and Ethan ended up losing this case too. He didn't give the uh, he didn't give the trunk back. He ref like he he just never got a like never bothered to try and give the trunk back or to pay him back for the clothes. It sounds like there wasn't a lot whole lot of repercussions like follow up repercussions obviously for a suit like you could just run away. Yeah, there really was. There was like there was like debtors prisons like if a debt got bad enough and you couldn't pay it back, uh, then you could get locked up in like a, what was basically like a glorified labor camp. And um, you'd spend like a certain amount of time in, in this, these prisons uh, in order to pay off your debt. Um, but even then, like that, that wasn't, it was, it was already a big thing in New England, but it was kind of only kind of sporadically used. Um, and it especially wasn't used for someone like the someone from like the Allen family, because the Allen family, like I like I mentioned in the last episode, the Allen family, even though they've got a reputation, uh, they're still like pretty high society within New England culture. So they'd never they a bougie family. Yeah. So they would never. So Ethan could just do this. And all that would happen is that they try to sue him again. Sounds about white. Yeah. At one point, Israel would actually send his two younger brothers to go and try and steal the trunk back from Ethan. And Ethan's wife, Mary, literally their sister, drove them away with an axe. <laughs> I, I, I need this just to be a little quick sketch gag to watch. I, I would. God, that would be hilarious to watch. I really wonder what happened to that trunk because he never gives it back. I wonder if he just takes it. He should have just 
burned it. At least they're closed. Here I'm going to find out that it's still like a prized relic within the Allen family to stay. <laughs> uh, do you doubt it? That'd be really funny. That'd be amazing. So now, uh, not only was Ethan penniless and homeless, he was now estranged from all of his in-laws because of this lawsuit. So with nowhere to go, Ethan was forced to make the embarrassing decision of returning to Salisbury, the place he had just been kicked out of, the first place he had just been kicked out of. How'd that go? Um, He was going to live with his brother, Heyman. The reason that he was allowed back in at all was one, because Heyman had kind of become like a well-respected figure within the community. And so they were like, okay, maybe Heyman can keep him in check. The second thing was he made it clear that he wasn't planning on staying because he decided Ethan was the kind of guy who'd look at a situation like this and decide, well, this isn't a failure. This is an opportunity. All, so all of these experiences that he'd had had understandably soured, soured him to living in established New England communities. And so instead, he took the advice of his old friend, Dr. Young, and he looked north past the Allegheny Mountains to the shores of Lake Champlain in what would eventually become the state that he would help found Vermont, but what at the time was called the New Hampshire Grants. Since, just to recap, just since the end of the war with France, that land had become opened up to safer settlement, and the government of New Hampshire was selling land grants for dirt cheap. The region had historically been a hunting ground for uh, the Kanyan Kaka people or the Mohawk tribe in white person speak. That, that, that's so fucking racist. Oh my God. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why white people insist on coming up with new names for these groups of people. Like Kanyan Kaka is not that difficult to pronounce. No, not really. Like it, it looks it, it looks complicated if you're reading it on a piece of paper, but once you actually like sound it out, like it's not it's not difficult to say. It's Kanye Kehaka or Kanye Kehaka. That that's the more proper pronunciation, but I'm proving myself wrong here. But anyways, so yeah, this was the a tradi- traditionally like a an area for hunting for the Mohawk people. Uh, but the Mohawks had largely abandoned it since they were trying to avoid conflict with British colonists, since now they didn't have their French allies. I thought I'd mention that, give a little bit of background. Ethan was still eager to find wealth and security, so he figured he could get into land speculation in this newly opened up market. On top of that, he was hoping, like his father had done when he was just a, a baby, that he would be able to get away from the religious persecution of New England Puritanism in order to find a new home in the wilderness. The opportunity was made more ideal by the fact that he would have connections already established in the grants since his cousin, Remember Baker, had already moved in and settled down. And he had been living in what would become Vermont for about four years by this point. Ethan's plan was to go up to the grants without his family and start surveying land that would be ideal for investment. While he did that, he would be hunting and selling furs through Heyman's general store in Salisbury in order to start paying off his debts and accumulating some wealth for him to start paying for land investments. And so he set up his wife and children with his brother Heyman in Salisbury, and he headed north. He spent the whole winter of 1767 and 68 living in the wilderness, hunting by day and sleeping under the lean, sleeping under lean twos at night. He just throws some twigs together, put some leaves on top of it and sleep under that. Uh, he mostly survived off of cornbread and venison from his hunts. Several times he found himself caught in bad snowstorms and was forced to spend nights walking around in circles in order to keep himself awake. Since if he fell asleep, he would freeze to death. Damn. Yeah, it was, he was living, like, the definition of roughing it. Like, this is, like, stereotypical outdoorsman's type stuff. But 
Through it all, as the snow began to thaw in the spring, he found himself with a canoe weighed down with furs, pelts, and salted preserved meats for him to take home and sell. He arrived back in Salisbury in the spring of 1768 to tell his family about the rich, gorgeous land that he had found there. He spent the summer and fall at Heyman's house reading and writing, which were his, like, like if, like I said, his two great passions were reading and writing. He, he was a scholar at heart. Of course he is. During that time, he was also sued once again by his brother-in-law, Israel Brownson, for compensation for the stolen trunk of clothes. The second time he sued for this. Yeah, because he'd never compensated Israel after the first lawsuit. But when he realized that Ethan was actually going to fight the charge instead of settling out of court, and since Israel himself was actually very deep in debt from the failed lead mine himself, there's a reason he hadn't paid Ethan, and it was because he didn't have any money himself. Uh, he just never showed up for the court date, and instead he actually fled north and settled in the New Hampshire grants, where Ethan was surveying at that moment. So, so that's that's one problem done. He doesn't have to worry about Israel anymore. He doesn't have to worry about the brother-in-law he fucked over. Yeah. Well, they kind of fucked each other over. It was a it was a mutual. Look. They they were both involved in a failed business venture. Fair. Also, that summer, Mary gave birth to her third child, Lucy Allen. So now. Uh, Ethan and Mary have two kids or three kids. I don't even remember the other them having kids. Like I know they had kids. I just don't remember where in the story it happened. Yeah, uh, I can't remember exactly either. Um, they don't bring up the kids a lot during these stories. Fair. It doesn't seem like the since he's not as well known. It doesn't feel like the kids went on to do a whole lot. I mean, they probably weren't unremarkable is just probably not as remarkable as he was um one of his actually this daughter i just mentioned lucy goes on to become like a pretty big deal um she she becomes the first american-born catholic nun wow yeah she after after her father's death she moves up to quebec converts to catholicism and becomes a nun and becomes the first the first nun born in America. Damn. So yeah, that that's something. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, so Ethan planned his second trip to the Grants in December of 1768. He went on that trip and he would eventually repeat that cycle three times after his first trip. So every year he'd go He'd go doing his hunting and surveying during the winter. He'd come back to Salisbury in the summer and just spend a summer writing and reading. Then he'd go back in the winter, come back in the summer. He did four trip, four winter trips. And so, yeah, he spent all that time acquainting himself with both the geography of the, the grants and the settlers of the, of the grants. He found a stretch of land that he decided he would eventually like to make his home. And by this point, he had done so much hunting that he finally had the cash to buy it. It was a plot of land about 30 square miles on the west side of the Green Mountains along the Winniski River, which at the time was called the Onion River. And I want to talk about that for a second. Uh, Winniski was an Algonquin word for river leads. And at the time, uh, the settlers called uh, river leads, um, they called them onions because they just kind of likened them to the onions they were used to back home or back in Europe. Interesting. And so Winniski and Onion River are both basically the same name in two different languages. I don't know why I found that interesting. It's really stupid, but I did. So, I mean, hey, we all have got to be entertained in our own little ways. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this this plot of land, it had a lot of game to hunt. It was rich in diversity of trees for him to cut and harvest. And the river made for some really great salmon fishing. He, he wrote in letters and in his memoirs that 
he caught salmon in this river that were up to 30 pounds. Was that him boasting or did he actually, was it actually possible? I mean, there have been salmon that have been like 30 pounds. They're just kind of rare. And he claimed that he was. No, I mean, does, is this like him boasting or. No, it was. Were there good size salmon in that river? It was, yeah, it was him. Like it, it might've just been him like talking up how great this place was like kind of exaggerating to make a point about like how rich and bountiful this land is. Um, but he might've also been telling the truth just to like kind of explain to people like the kind of stuff they could find out here. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like boasting because fishing wasn't like a com- competitive thing back then. It was just a matter of like getting food. So um, in May of 1770, He bought the titles of about a thousand acres of land for, listen to this price, a thousand acres of land for about 12 pounds. What? Which was less than a thousand dollars. 12 pounds for over a thousand acres of land sounds way too low even for back then. Um, There's, there's a reason. One reason was because it was just brand new land, unsettled land. It was a market that was just being opened up, and so prices were very, very low starting out. The second thing is that there were a lot of people that were hesitant to buy, and there's a reason for that that I'll get into in just a minute. But yeah, just think about that. A thousand acres of land for less than a dollar per acre. I mean, adjusted for inflation, what was 12 pounds? Do you know? Um, it was it was a little less than a thousand dollars. Okay. Dang. Yeah, it... Also, incidentally, 12 pounds was the amount of money that he owed to that guy for the beaver skin cap. <laughs> <laughs> so pay back a debt for a hat or buy a thousand pounds worth of the richest land in the colonies. Not not a not a very complicated calculus to make there. No, I, I, I would have probably done the same thing. Yeah. Um, the first thing that he did was, I don't know, I know why I put this in, but it's completely not relevant because he, this guy never shows up again in the story. But the first thing that he did with this land was he started construction on a house for his younger brother, or one of his other younger brothers that we haven't mentioned yet. Okay. Uh, this brother had been living with his family for the last couple of years. So I think he moved into Salisbury in like 1768. This younger brother's name was Haber Allen. You did that just for the shot, didn't you? Just for the shot. Let's do it, baby. You dick. Do you got your shot ready? No, no, because uh... I was all proud of you and ready to praise you again for having your shot ready. But damn, what am I going to do? Just hacking a fraud. Just leave a shot sitting there for however long it'll take me to get to the next one that's literally what i do wow your shot i pour another one right after it, it makes me take an extra shot at the end of the night because i can't pour it back i mean i just take a couple more sips right out of the bottle at the end of the night what are you doing <laughs> i don't need an excuse to do that i don't so we're i i love drinking and like i love tequila like it's my thing i don't like drinking liquor out of the bottle i don't know why i don't have a problem with it but i'm also extremely mentally ill so well, I, I'm not far <laughs> behind you. It's just, I don't know what it is. It's just like, for some reason, I maybe it's the way the liquor flows or something. I, I don't know. I it, It's the way the, the liquid gets into my mouth. It's like not fast enough or something. Like, I like to have like a mouthful and swallow. Like, it's weird. Yeah. Anyways. Prost. Cheers. Yeah, so this, this guy's name was Haber Allen. And I don't know if I... Uh, explain this, but uh, Ethan's father, Joseph, uh, specifically chose all of these names because they were names associated, they're names from warriors in the Old Testament. I didn't know that. I don't, I'm not that good of a biblical scholar. Yeah, so Ethan, Haman, Haber, those are all like like brave like warriors from the Old Testament. That was the whole theme he was going for. And uh, I, I want to mention a couple other of his siblings' names, but I don't, I don't want to because I don't know if you'll find them weird enough to take a shot. So I want to bring them up organically. 1770, he moved his family from Salisbury to a rented, a rented house 
uh, like a one and a half story house in the town of Bennington, which is was right by a tavern called the Catamount Tavern. The reason I mentioned that is because the Catamount Tavern is probably one of the most, if not the most important buildings in the entire state of Vermont. Oh, it would eventually become the birthplace of the state of Vermont. Nice. And his his house that he was renting in Bennington was right next to it. Sounds about right. So his new life seemed to be just beginning. His new career in land spe- speculation was a, it was going great. He it looked like he was about to get some great yields, some great returns on it, all of his investments. He could have made a life like this, but he refused to stay. No, this actually this was out of his control. Okay. Interesting. The problem was he found that he was having trouble finding buyers for all of this land that he was buying up. Because as it turns out, the titles to the land that he was buying and that he was trying to sell were technically illegal. Oh, shit. Or maybe they weren't illegal. It depends on whose side you were taking. Get into the weeds for me. As it turns out, there's a little bit of confusion over which colony actually had jurisdiction over the land. They didn't know if it was New York or New Hampshire that actually owned that land. Okay, and which which colony did he get it from? New Hampshire. Okay. All of these settlers were buying land granted by the former governor of New Hampshire, a guy named, oh, uh, I think this might be another shot, Benning Wentworth. That's not that weird of a name. B-E-N-N-I-N-G. Yeah, I can't tell you where, but that sounds like a name I've heard before. There's a Fort Benning, but that was a that was based on the last name. It sounds like a name I've heard before, though. Like not, and I don't mean like I've like heard out in real life, not like, oh, I I heard about this such and such place. Yeah, I I guess I I think it's a really weird name, but it. I'll go and give you the shot, but like, I want you to know, it doesn't sound that weird to me. Uh. I think it ju- it's just because it sounds similar enough to other names that we like find normal. Fair, I guess. I think I think that's the thing because like Benning, it it kind of has the same cadence as like normal names that we're familiar with. Even though it's in my mind, that's a completely bonkers batshit name. So thing to name, like imagine looking at a baby that you've just given birth to in the in the seventeen hundreds when it could easily kill you. Oh, no, it's a shit name. Yeah, and you look at this little miracle of life in your arms, and you think to yourself, I'm going to name you Benning. <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Where did that name even... We've already seen plenty of questionable names out in the wild. Yeah, I saw this uh, person on Twitter. Um, her name is her first name is Teriyaki. Bro, your parents hated you. Even if your parents were Oriental, that's not a good name to name your kid. Uh, her parents were not Asian in any sense. Anyways, you want to shoot for that one? I said I'll give you the shot. I just poured mine. Okay, gross. Cheers. So, yeah. The settlers were buying land granted by the former governor of New Hampshire, Benning Wentworth, who didn't actually have a clear directive from the Crown to actually be granting that land. And actually had been removed as governor by the crown specifically because he was granting that land. Oh, damn. He was selling these grants so that he could pocket the cash. So that that was like a perk of being a governor is that um, you had the authority to sell crown lands and you were allowed to take the profits from selling that land. Uh, so that that wasn't an abnormal thing, but he was doing it with land that he didn't have clear jurisdiction over, which caused him to be removed from his position and replaced actually by his son, a guy named John Wentworth, who will is a come up. Were they just that good old boy that they would trust the son of the man who just did shit like that? Like, yeah, yeah, pretty much. You you only want my dude. Uh, you've just proved your your family line isn't super trustful. You think I'm going to trust your boy? There, there were, they were kind of short on people in the colonies because the population itself already wasn't that big. And the amount of people that were rich enough and well, and well brought up, well bred enough to, for the crown to consider putting in a position of power was even smaller. So you kind of take what you can get if you're being that uh, selective 
But anyways, um, yeah, so prospective buyers from Ethan were hesitant to buy because those plots of land that he was trying to sell also had titles that were granted by the colony of New York. So he was trying to sell them titles that were granted by New Hampshire when they had already been seen those those same plots of land with titles from New York. And the thing was, New York had a more solid uh, claim of jurisdiction in the form of a royal proclamation declaring that they had... Well, okay, it's complicated. There, uh, there was a royal proclamation in 1664 which claimed that New York had the rights to a... It was a specific but kind of poorly defined area of land. But it had kind of been understood and interpreted as including the land that would eventually become Vermont. Okay. And so that document was just a more solid claim that New York had to the lands. Makes sense. And so what made these... Yeah. So what made these deals less sweet to prospective buyers is that these convicting claims had already caused a legal battle to break out between New York and New Hampshire. The government of New York, which was led... Oh my god, there's another name. You forgot about a name. Really? I find that hard to believe. Yeah. Oh, this this is one of my favorites, too. Uh, the government of New York, which was led by the royal governor... Bear with me with this first name. Cadwallader Colden. Damn. Your parents really hated your ass, son. Cadwallader. Where does that name come from? Who who thinks of that word and thinks to themselves, yeah, that's a good first name. That's a strong first name that will command respect. Cadwallader. I would have made fun of that. I would have dogged on a man named Cadwallader. I'm not even bothering pouring this one. I'm just doing it straight from a drop bottle. Prost. Cheers. But yeah, the governor of New York was Cadwallader Coleman, and the government of New York was threatening to evict the settlers and the grants, who um, basically they were saying, unless you come to New York and you pay like a ridiculous amount of money that almost none of them could afford to buy a confirmatory grant from the state of New York or from the colony of New York, then they would... Um, be legally classified as squatters and be evicted from the land so that the so that uh land land speculators in New York could come in and buy those grants and take over that land. So basically New York was extorting the the people who had already settled in the the New Hampshire grants saying uh if you don't pay us then we'll kick you out of your homes. Uh, this conflict also had an ideological angle to it as well. So I explained like the sort of radical roots of Prot or of uh, Puritanism at the beginning of the last episode, and the way that that influenced the formation of New England society. Even though it wasn't like like a perfect democracy, like the like the original Puritans envisioned, it was still still significantly less centralized than a lot of other places in the colonies. So where where New Englanders uh, practiced town hall meetings and preferred like small family farms, New York was a lot closer to its feudal English roots. In New York, there was New York was basically ruled by a class of enormous landowners who controlled almost all of the settled land in upstate New York. And there was an underclass of tenant farmers who farmed the land and in, ex in exchange for being able to live on the land and farm it, they would pay rent to these absentee landlords in the form of a portion of their crop yield, which were usually like really big portions, up to 40% in some cases. Dang. While cities like Boston and New York City were embroiled in the Stamp Act riots, there were tenant farmers in upstate New York that were having a little uprising of their own, fighting against the impoverished conditions and the political powerlessness of being a tenant farmer. It was basically feudalism. It was a continuation of feudalism by other means that had been exported to the colonies. Sounds about right. Um, yeah, and this, this uprising had been put down, but the experience was still fresh in the minds of New York's ruling class, and they viewed the New Englander settlers of the New Hampshire grants 
as squatters and potentially rebels against the tenant system. The settlers of New Hampshire grants initially tried to resist the eviction notices from New York by sending a petition to the king himself, but it would take the better part of a year estimated for the petition to reach London, then be read by the king, then have a response drafted, and then be sent back to New Hampshire. And in the meantime, the settlers were facing incursions by land surveyors and police that were preparing to round them up and force them off of their land, off, off of this land that they had sunk so much time and money into in order to cultivate and make into their, their homes. As it turns out, that petition, uh, um, it made it, but it wouldn't get back for another three years. And by that point, yeah, by that point, other stuff had happened. What other stuff? Some stuff that I'll get to in just a moment. <sighs> At a meeting of shareholders, like like land speculators and the grants, um, they there were a bunch of shareholders in the the New Hampshire grants that held a meeting in Connecticut in 1769 that included Ethan. This was just before his, he moved his families onto the Grants. Um, Ethan was chosen to represent the Grants settlers in a lawsuit against uh, New York land speculators in order to confirm the rights of the settlers in the New York Supreme Court in Albany. Specifically, this case would be uh, in relation to um, New York had finally... Uh, finally decided to go through with their threats and had issued eviction paperwork for four settlers in the settlement of Shaftesbury. And so this case was to defend the settlers of Shaftesbury against these land speculators who were accusing them of squatting. So first, Ethan traveled to New Hampshire in order to acquire copies of the deed to the township of Shaftesbury from the governor, John Wentworth, which he would argue in, in the Supreme Court was legally binding to the crown and that New York didn't have a right to violate it. And then he went back to Connecticut so that he could retain a lawyer by the name of Jared Ingersoll, who was one of the best lawyers in New England at the time. From there, they traveled to Albany and they arrived in the, in the capital of New York in June of 1770. Ethan was really confident in this case. He had a top-tier lawyer on his team. He had the legal documentation to back up his armies, or back up his, back up his arguments. The thing was, he was unaware of one fact that, or he either didn't know about it or he didn't take it into account. That was that nearly all of the justices serving on the New York Supreme Court held New York grants to the lands that Ethan was defending. Ah, that's rigged. It was rigged from the start. The lawyer representing the New York claims, James Duane, was one of the leading New York speculators in the New Hampshire grants and had been leading the charge to have the grant settlers evicted. He was also, nobody knew this until after the fact, he was secretly colluding with the attorney general who was pros who was uh he was secretly colluding with the attorney general of new york uh in order to throw the case in the land speculators favor so he was he was literally a defense attorney colluding with a prosecuting attorney to throw a case in a specific way that both of them would financially benefit from again sounds about white sounds about white <laughs> James Duane would go on to become a founding father and the one of the representatives from New York to the Continental Congress during the Revolutionary War. So that's a fun fact. Don't you love finding ab about how corrupt our history is from the beginning? There were a lot of really bad people in the Continental Congress, actually. No, I would have never guessed. Like, I think the only good people in the Continental Congress were like John and Samuel Adams... And I don't know, there's probably a couple other guys from New England that na their names aren't very famous that were probably pretty good on a lot of issues. But yeah, anyways, so during the case, the justices ruled that the township paperwork that Ethan had brought 
they declared that those that paperwork was inadmissible as evidence. What? Because they said that New Hampshire had no claim to the grants, meaning that there was no legal basis for establishing the settler's claim to the grants. And so the township, the deed to the township of, uh, of the, the town that was being in, in this case, uh, New York, they, the justices declared was not legally established. Lovely. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Which the whole point of this case was to decide on whether or not the claims of the New Hampshire grants were actually legal in the first place. And the entire thing was being run by people with a vested material interest, probably worth the modern equivalent of tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars to swing in New York's favor. Does not surprise me. It's called, I can be unbiased, says the person who has a vested interest in not being biased (laughs) so this court made up of landlords ruled that the settlers were squatting (laughs) and that the eviction orders would go through ethan who at this point was i i kind of see this as like the point when ethan became a little bit less of an idealist don't get me wrong ethan was an idealist until the day he died but this was the day that a little bit of realism kind of seeped into his character. This was the day when he switched from being just a wide-eyed young radical burying his nose in books to an actual revolutionary. This was the moment that it happened. Ethan was shocked and mortified by the ruling. And the settlers of the New Hampshire grants were terrified that their entire livelihoods were about to be stolen from them by authorities representing the crown. The last legal remedy to save the settlers had failed. As Ethan was preparing to leave Albany in order to return to Bennington, he was approached by uh, James Duane and the Attorney General of New York, this guy named John Tabor Kempe. These two guys basically tried to bribe Ethan. Of course. Yeah, they they wanted to bribe Ethan into convincing him or getting him to convince the other settlers to give up their land without too much of without too much trouble. They knew that he was well respected in the grants. Obviously, he had been chosen to represent them in this case, and they knew that he was a really good public speaker. So they thought that he was their best shot at resolving this whole thing as peacefully as possible. We're not entirely sure what his response was. That was never recorded. There's a lot of different stories. I bet it was a resounding "go fuck yourself." Um, the the legend that's told to kids in Vermont to this day uh, is that he told them to go fuck themselves with like a nice little biblical allegory. Uh, I'm actually going to hold on. I'm going to grab my book real quick. Um, like the way that he would tie uh, biblical references into his speech in order to make a point. But it was really... I didn't realize he had been doing that. Yeah, I, I mentioned it in the first episode. He would, His whole life, he was really famous for... Because of his really deep, intricate knowledge of the Bible, he always used Bible, like, Bible verses in order to make points about certain things. He was approached by James Duane and the Attorney General of New York, John Tabor Kempe. Um, they tried to bribe him with 2,000 pounds in cash... And a fancy, like, like purebred horse uh, that he could ride back to Bennington. Like, that would have been an obvious. Yeah. According to the Vermont legend, um, he, um, he repudiated them. And he got mad at them and told them that they were, like, a bunch of scoundrels and whatever. Um, uh, what, they, what they were trying to, con- were trying to bribe him to do was to get them to get the uh, New Hampshire grant settlers to surrender their lands peacefully after he like repudiated them and basically told them to go fuck themselves they responded with we have might on our side and you know that might often prevails against right they really used might makes right yeah they that's how the story goes and then ethan allen responded quote the gods of the valleys are not the gods of the hills and according to the story, apparently 
Dwayne and uh, Kempe didn't understand the reference because they asked him to explain what he meant, and he only responded, "Come up to Bennington, and I'll and you'll know very well what it means." What he was referring to was First uh, Kings chapter twenty, verse twenty-eight, which is a story where an army of a few hundred Israelites destroys and completely annihilates an army of Syrians, a hundred thousand strong. I had no idea where that was going. I thought it was going to be like a, the people sitting on lofty on the thrones can't imagine what the people who are actually doing the work can do go through. That's where I thought it was going. There's actually a lot of like anthropology, anthropology that goes into that quote, that Bible verse too, because in, in ancient times, um, the hills were like a symbol for freedom from like kings and gods and things like that. And the valleys where cities were built and like river valleys, the original cities were built in river valleys and that's where the first kings and emperors first appeared. And so uh, valleys were seen as the place of tyranny and valley or, and hills were seen as a taste is the, the area like, where liberty ruled, where the old ways of like uh, like nomadic life and hunting and hunting and gathering and freedom from governments. That's that that was the idea in like early human history. That's what's being referenced here. And so what what Ethan is saying actually is um, he's referring to the settlers as um, as the Israelites, just a small army of a few hundred. And he's referring to the New Yorkers as the Syrians, an army 100,000 strong. And he's saying that if the New Yorkers try to come into the New Hampshire grants, then they'll be destroyed by a significantly smaller army. And uh, Dwayne and Kempe just absolutely did not get the, get the message. They didn't understand it at all. They should have, because like biblical knowledge was much more widely known, I guess you could say back then like um among certain groups of people by this point well i would i would argue that this is me again as someone who's not a historian but like the abrahamic religions in the founding of america were like the backbone like everyone quote unquote believed back then like they at least knew about it right um that is that is actually something that I push back on people a lot when they okay. say. And the reason for that is because this was, we're, we're living, these people were living in the aftermath of the Enlightenment. The ideas of the Enlightenment where rationality was like, according to the text, rationality is triumphing over um, the religious basis for thought and ideology of the medieval period was starting to this that was starting to happen which that the, there's a lot to say about that framing of history but in some sense it was true um religion was starting to become significantly less a part of people's lives in this period of time okay that's that's good to know that where that kind of did that start then or was there other times where that kind of started um Throughout the history of Europe and like Western civilization, it kind of it kind of came in waves. There were periods where uh, religion was like the center of people's lives, like the center of society, and then there were periods where religion kind of fell out of vogue and was kind of a background force. And this was a period of time when religion was kind of a background force. Okay, um, the Bible was still like a big part of like the language that people used but like for example a lot of the founding fathers were deists like thomas jefferson and later in his life you've mentioned that before yeah like thomas jefferson later in his life uh george washington john adams a lot of them were guys who were very skeptical of biblical teachings and relied a lot more on rationality and a lot of that was because in their own upbringings they their educations focus more on enlightenment on the learning of enlightenment texts as opposed to like a strictly biblical interpretation of or a strictly biblical framework through which 
they were learning, like was traditional in like way back in the medieval period of European history. Okay. Yeah. So, so a lot of upper class people in the colonies at this time wouldn't have had as strict a an education in uh, biblical teachings as um, as you'd kind of expect, even though they'd have a lot of as we kind of like perceive it to be nowadays. Right. Yeah. We're kind of in a period where um, not not to get too deep into it, but we're kind of in a period where that's kind of coming back when religion is kind of becoming the center of society again. And it's not a good thing. No, not at all, in my opinion. Yeah, but that's a discussion for another time. But anyways, the fact that Ethan was really well-versed in the Bible was kind of an anomaly. And it was because he had been raised, like, his his only education besides his one year of formal tutoring was lear- becoming literate by learning the Bible. And that was very much an anomaly amongst upper-class people in colonial America. They were much more focused on enlightenment readings. So, but yeah, that's, I kind of like that story. That's still like a very important aspect of like the state of Vermont's founding legend to this day is that story. Um, But so Ethan was offered this bribe of 2000 pounds and like a really well-bred horse. We don't know exactly how he responded in this conversation. What we do know is that he took the bribe. Oh, He took the money and he took the horse and he wrote back. But he definitely didn't follow through, right? But he didn't follow through. That's the thing. He just took their money and ran. That's that's kind of what I imagine would have happened. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, I'll he probably would have given them like a speech about how they're stupid and then said, "Okay, I'll still take your money, though. Well, actually, based on like his later political maneuvering, like later in his life after what we're talking about right now. What they think actually happened was that he went along with what they were saying so that he could convince them. Because later on, you'll get a sense for like how, like what kind of political operator he was. He was really big about playing both sides so that no matter who was, no matter who came out on top, he was on the right side. That's what he was really good at. And so he was a fence sitter. He wasn't a fence sitter. In this situation, I know for a fact that he had no intention of actually like carrying out what Dwayne and Kempy wanted, because at this point he like like the the case had just happened. He was pissed off. He was more angry than anybody had ever been in their entire lives. So he one hundred percent never had any intention of following through on accepting this bribe, but but he did take the money and he did take the horse. Just to fuck them over. I mean, fair enough. Like, fair enough. Yeah. So he, what most likely happened is that he left them thinking that he would actually do what he said. He would actually do what they asked him to do. But when he arrived back in back in Bennington, he went to a meeting at the Catamount Tavern. I don't think I mentioned this. Do you know what a Catamount is? No, I do not. That is an old like 18th century English word for a mountain lion. What? Yeah. Mountain lions in, in New England were called catamounts. Do you, do, where did that come from? Do you know? Well, think, think of like, break down the word cat, a mount cat of mountain. The, but you're not pronouncing it like catamount cat of mountain. You're, you're, you're pronouncing like cad a mountain. That's because I'm drunk. <laughs> Okay. Catamount. Yeah, it's it's spelled catamount. Okay. And it's like it's like a short and easy way to say like cat of a mountain or a mountain or mountain lion, like we'd call it. I guess that makes more sense if it's cat o mountain or cat of mountain rather than But the reason it was called the Catamount Cat Catamount Tavern was because um around this time the owner of the tavern had erected a twenty foot tall uh, like pillar made out of wood and had mounted a stuffed catamount or a, a stuffed mountain lion at the top with it with its teeth bared west in the direction of New York. Interesting. 
which was like it was a symbol of like a fuck you to new york like if you try to come and take our homes then we'll be mountain lions to you and we'll kill all of you i kind of assumed that was the intent anyways it was a giant middle finger right so Ethan returned to the meeting at the Catamount Tavern, and he delivered the news to a gathering of hundreds of settlers that the the court had the Supreme Court of New York had ruled against the, the settlers, and there were no legal options left. And they all he also uh, presented like he also told the crowd that uh, Dwayne and Kempy had tried to bribe him. Oh, so he tattled. Yeah, he. He took the money and he kept it, but then he also used the fact that they bribed him as evidence of how dastardly and evil the New Yorkers were. Fair. So you see playing both sides. And so this speech that he gave in the aftermath was so riveting. Um, he, he declared the people of the, that he declared that the people of the New Hampshire grants would have to take up arms in order to defend their property. And the speech was so insanely effective that in the following weeks, there was like this revolutionary rebellious spirit that spread to every corner of the New Hampshire grants. And Ethan's leadership had cemented a determination in the people of the Green Mountains to resist the encroachment of New York by any means necessary. On September 26, 1770, a group of 300 sheriff's deputies led by the Albany County Sheriff and also joined by a land surveyor appeared at the farm of a settler settler named James Breckenridge, who is also one of the uh, settlers who was facing eviction in the court case that Ethan had just lost. What What does his name sound familiar? Was he someone big? Breckenridge? Or is that just a, like a last name I'm wrecking? Yeah, there's a company here. There's like an energy company or something here in Oklahoma that's called Breckenridge. That's probably what you're hearing it from. Or what you're... Well, you know, it, if, it doesn't feel like it was just Breckenridge. It's like something Breckenridge is that sounds familiar. But hey-ho. I don't know. It might might just be a coincidence. But... Probably. But yeah, this a group of 300 cops showed up to the farm of this guy named James Breckenridge. But... The posse was driven off by a group of armed townsmen. So a bunch of other settlers came out with muskets and swords and farming, like, scythes and pitchforks and stuff. And they stood their ground against the cops, and they forced the cops to turn around and go back to New York. Nice. That was the first act of disobedience against New York. By the spring of 1771... There was a full-fledged guerrilla war being waged by the settlers against New York land speculators and the Albany police. This war was being fought by organized companies of local volunteer militia from all over the grants. Every town was raising militias and contributing to this fight. They coordinated their defense of their homes from the Catamount Tavern in Bennington. Ethan Allen was their undisputed commander and the unquestionable leader of the New Hampshire grants. Their enemies in New York called them the Bennington mob, which was a name that they happily adopted for themselves. It's one of those times when an insult didn't land and it just became a rally cry. Right. Yeah. But they, at the time they were referred to as the Bennington mob, but history would remember them better by their later name, the green mountain boys. Yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah. And That's all I have for this week. It's kind of interesting to see how, like, incomplete our knowledge of history is due to our shitty education system. (laughs) It's that that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately is like, of course, like it makes sense. We don't cover this like it's not really relevant to the American history, but the amount of like tangential stuff we should know from this is kind of ridiculous. Yeah, like, on the one hand, I understand that, like, you can't teach a middle schooler or a high schooler all of the gritty details of every single aspect of human history. But at the same, but that what that means is that the way that we have to teach children and the way that they, excuse me, the way that we have to educate people 
in history relies on the way that we frame it and the way that we like the lens through which we analyze history and what we deem to be important or pertinent to understanding our own place in contemporary history. And the way that we are taught history in American schools is very much pretty shitty. Yeah, it's shitty, but specifically it's shitty because it's taught through the lens of a particular understanding of American history that is both ahistoric and profoundly useless Mm -hmm. like actually having a like a genuine understanding of the time period like the way we teach like the revolution leaves so much detail out it's ridiculous like we think we teach american history pretty deeply no ain't no way in hell and um have you ever heard the term or the name ticonderoga before I don't think so. It was one of the most important, uh, I wouldn't even call it a battle. It was one of the most important military actions of the Revolutionary War. And that's another thing about not just the Revolutionary War, but the Civil War. We only talk about the quote unquote important battles, the, the, the key point battles. We don't talk about like, hey, this is a lose. Then we only really talk about the important winning battles unless like someone betrayed like the only time I remember hearing about a battle in the Revolutionary War that was important in my history education was one that was about um, I think it was Benedict Arnold. That that was the only reason like it's like, oh, we had troubles because of him because he's important, quote unquote. Yeah, he Even though he betrayed the Continental Army, not much actually came out of his betrayal. He didn't accomplish much of anything. And they made that a big deal when I was a kid. Like, he's he's our traitor. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I don't think... I don't think I'm going to end up covering, like, his betrayal of the Continental Army in this story. So I'll go ahead and, like, talk about it. Um, What Benedict Arnold was trying to do when he betrayed the Continental Army was to pass information on the the troop and and artillery garrison at the at the fort at West Point which was one of which was uh in New York it's uh was one of the most strategically important points in keeping the British army like holed up in Canada and keeping them from invading down south and in, directly into the heart of the colonies and he was trying to provide information on the troop and artillery deployment garrisoned at West Point. The British Army ended up never actually attacking West Point. Like, the only time I remember in my history classes, again, small town, probably not a representative of, like, a real American U.S. history class because, like, they only teach what they really want to, to be honest. Um, The only time West Point was mentioned was actually in the Civil War, and they talked about how awkward it was when it broke out. And they were like, okay, we have people who are going to be with the Union. We got people who are going to be with the Confederacy. And there was this, like, quote-unquote amicable but, like, tense breaking up. It's like, okay, you guys need to leave. We're suspending classes. I didn't even learn about that. Like, I, I don't know if that's an accurate way of describing it. But, like, it was brought up that, hey... After that first, I, I think it was after the first battle that that happened. Yeah, the Battle of Bull Run or the f- first Bull Run. The, the the shot, the whatever that was heard around the world or whatever. That was the Revolutionary War. Of OK, then whatever it was, that was probably Bull Run. They were like, hey, shit got real. It's time for us to split up. Call classes are done. Oh, you're probably thinking of um there was this i remember it was there was this like island fort uh oh my god what was that fort called fort sumter yeah fort sumter yes fort sumter fort sumter yeah the the opening shots of the civil war were the confederacy firing on fort sumter um and i remember after that happened my one of my history teachers said hey this news got back to us uh west point we're we're Cancel classes are over. Everyone go to your sides. Um, I've never heard that before, and that sounds really unlikely because the Union was 
uh, the union government was even like to some extent early in the war, uh, especially later in the war, but early in the war, even to some extent, were really, really cracked down hard on uh, Confederate sympathizers, especially within the like the officer ranks. I'm probably simplifying it too much. And it was it was a like a it was supposed to be like a freshman in high school class. It was pretty dumbed down that. And it was a coach who taught the class, a football coach. So yeah, that that kind of sounds like kind of like the there's this like an aspect of like the lost cause myth in that like neo Confederate spread to tr- to try to clean up the reputation of the Confederacy um, is that they they try to claim that a lot of Union officers and troops were cordial with. Uh, confederate officers because they had been like uh because they still saw them as like legitimate uh figures within uh the american army or the the american military and uh that it's it's complete nonsense because well it's like that um it's like that that horrible argument oh we shouldn't destroy uh confederate monuments because they during reconstruction they were considered u.s troops again or blah 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 and we shouldn't disrespect them or whatever yeah it's nonsense and it is actually true that the federal government recognized confederate troops yeah i know but it's just a shitty excuse yeah it is a shitty excuse and um but yeah that is that is a way that a lot of like lost cause mythers will will frame will frame it like the as far as I know, I might be mistaken in this, but as far as I know, West Point never shut down classes because, uh, because they wanted to, they were giving their, giving some of the students free reign to go back to the Confederacy and fight for their own side. That never happened, as far as I know. Um, I don't know if it was exactly like, hey, you're you're gonna, some people are gonna go to the Confederacy. I was kind of, I don't know how to describe it other than the way they, I did. But this could be just like, you know, oh, I got a shitty history lesson and this is how I remember that shitty history lesson. But I bet what that story came from was from the fact that there were there were many like like all of the most prominent officers, both in the Union and the Confederacy, all went to West Point and many of them were classmates with each other. And so there were a lot of instances of battles where. Um, a union, a union general will be sending, like, con- sending his troops to fight against a Confederate general's troops, and they were like roommates or unit mates at West Point, and that that was a really common thing that happened a lot, and it did shape the way that a lot of officers um, interpreted the Civil War after the fact, but. Um, the idea that it affected like what the operations of West Point, because there there were a lot of students who left West Point in order to go back to the South and fight for the Confederacy. That did happen. No, I I, I absolutely do not doubt that. Like, yeah, that 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 was, yeah, I I can't remember the exact numbers, but I remember reading somewhere that West Point's classes dropped by like a certain percent for the duration of the Civil War because they didn't get any any. Uh, cadets in from the south um but yeah like like the the way that you described it like complete nonsense as most of small town history lessons were like i i i'm not gonna even pretend like half of the history lessons i got at that school were like spot on or accurate anyways do you have any uh like what are your what are your thoughts on Ethan Allen? Where do you, I actually want to ask you where do you think this story is going next? Well, you said he founded Vermont and that it's not really there yet. So I imagine this the Green Mountain Boy stuff. You said it was a state before the Union, like bef- before it joined the U.S. I'm kind of feeling like it kind of like becomes its own like government right before or during the Revolutionary War, since you said he was involved in the Revolutionary War. And then, like a few years or so after that, it joins the Union because I think I don't think it was like right away we got our 14th state. Yeah, and I I feel like 
I don't know. I don't know how much further it goes. Am I anywhere near close? Yeah. Yeah, you're you're actually spot on with a lot of that. Um, I will say, even though Ethan Allen's involvement in the Revolutionary War was really important and a huge aspect of the Revolutionary War that often gets overlooked, um, it actually, like in the in the timeline of the Revolutionary War, is not that extensive. His actual involvement in the war starts and ends within the first year of the war before. Oh, damn. So, like, he just, like, helps the beginning of the war and then just fucks off? We'll get to that. (laughs) He, in a sense, he does fuck off. It might not have been completely voluntary, but technically, I suppose, yes. (laughs) I will elaborate in coming episodes, but yes. But, yeah, his, his involvement in the Revolutionary War starts and ends before 1776 interesting that's crazy i i would have never guessed that see the way you had talked i would have assumed that he had like a like time wise he had a decent role in u.s history like the revolutionary war yeah he definitely does but that's because he gets in early and he leaves his mark really early and then his his character and his reputation kind of is kind of like a shadow on everything that comes after it. Interesting. We, I will explain everything, and it'll make a lot more sense when we get to that. In our next episode, which will hopefully be in two weeks, uh, if I don't fuck up again and get caught up in a whole bunch of personal stuff. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. Tim, got any pluggables? Uh, so they can find me at Twitter at Tim, a.k.a. Otis. What about you? They can find me on Twitter at Visigoth. The I is a one, the O is a zero. And if you're looking to follow the podcast for updates, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at the Alexander Society Pod and on Twitter at Alex Society Pod. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a rate and a review on your streaming platform of choice. Thank you and have a great night. Bye.